Dear NASA, happy birthday. Perhaps you don't know, but we're the same age. In the first week of October, 1958, you were born of the National Aeronautics and Space Act as a civilian space agency. Well, I was born of my mother <laughs> in the East Bronx. Wrong there ain't that many people from the Bronx here. <laughs> so the year-long celebration of our shared 60th anniversary provides me a unique occasion to reflect on our past, present, and future. I was three years old when John Glenn first orbited Earth. I was seven when you lost astronauts Grissom, Chaffee, and White in that tragic fire of their Apollo 1 capsule on the launch pad. I was 10 when you launched Armstrong and Aldrin, when you landed Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon. And I was 14 when you stopped going to the moon altogether. Over that time, I was excited for you and for America. But the vicarious thrill of the journey, so prevalent in the hearts and minds of others, was absent from my emotions. I was obviously too young to be an astronaut, but I also knew that my skin color was much too dark for you to picture me as a part of this epic adventure. Not only that, even though you are a civilian agency, your most celebrated astronauts were military pilots at a time when war was becoming less and less popular. During the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement was more real to me than it surely was to you. In fact, it took a directive from Vice President Johnson in 1963 to force you to hire black engineers at your prestigious Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. I found the correspondence in your archive. Do you remember? James Webb, then head of NASA, wrote to German rocket pioneer Werner von Braun, who headed the center, and who was the chief engineer of the entire manned space program. The letter boldly and bluntly directs von Braun to address the, quote, lack of equal employment opportunity for Negroes in the region and to collaborate with area colleges, Alabama A&M and Tuskegee Institute, to identify, train, and recruit qualified Negro engineers into the NASA Huntsville family. In 1964, you and I had not yet turned six when I saw picketers outside the newly built apartment complex of our choice in the Riverdale section of the Bronx. They were protesting to prevent Negro families, mine included, from moving there. I was glad their effort failed. These buildings were called, perhaps prophetically, the Sky View Apartments, on whose roof, 22 stories over the Bronx, I would later train my telescope on the universe. My father was active in the Civil Rights Movement, working under New York City's Mayor Lindsay to create job opportunities for youth in the ghetto, as the inner city was called back then. Year after year, the forces operating against this effort were huge. Poor schools, bad teachers, meager resources, abject racism and assassinated leaders. So while you were celebrating your monthly advances in space exploration from Mercury to Gemini to Apollo, I was watching America do all it could to marginalize who I was and what I wanted to become in life. I looked to you for guidance, for a vision statement that I could adapt that would fuel my ambitions, but you weren't there for me. Of course, I shouldn't blame you for society's woes. Your conduct was a symptom of America's habits, not a cause. I knew this, but you should nonetheless know that among my colleagues, I'm the only one in my generation who became an astrophysicist in spite of your achievements in space, rather than because of them. For my inspirations, I instead turned to libraries, remaindered books on the cosmos, from bookstores, my rooftop telescope, and the Hayden Planetarium. 
After some fits and starts through my years in school, where becoming an astrophysicist seemed at times to be the path of most resistance through an unwelcoming society, I became a professional astrophysicist. I became a scientist. Over the decades that followed, you've come a long way. Whoever does not yet recognize the value of this adventure to our nation's future soon will, as the rest of the development and developing world passes us by in every measure of technological leadership and strength. Not only that, these days you look much more like America. From your senior level managers to your most decorated astronauts, congratulations. You now belong to the entire citizenry. Examples of this abound, but I especially remember when the public took ownership of the Hubble telescope, your most beloved unmanned mission. They all spoke loudly back in the 2004, ultimately reversing the threat that the telescope might not be serviced a fourth time, extending its life for another decade. Hubble's transcendent images of the cosmos had spoken to us all, as did the personal profiles of the space shuttle astronauts who deployed and serviced the telescope, and the scientists who benefited from its data stream. Not only that, I had even joined the ranks of your most trusted, as I served dutifully on your prestigious advisory council. I came to recognize that when you're at your best, nothing in this world can inspire the dreams of a nation the way you can. Dreams fueled by a pipeline of ambitious students eager to become scientists, engineers, and technologists in the service of the greatest quest there ever was. Sorry, sorry. to represent a fundamental part of America's identity. Not only to itself, but to the world. So as we both turn 60 and begin our 61st trip around the sun, I want you to know that I feel your pains and share your joys. And I look forward to seeing you back on the moon. But don't stop there. Mars beckons, as do destinations beyond. Birthday buddy. <laughs> <laughs> even, if I, even if I have not always been, I am now your humble servant, Neil deGrasse Tyson.